<laughs> Hi, I'm Rad Linux, and today we're going to be getting root on this Wi Fi router. So this is an older AC device produced in about 2014 by a now defunct Philadelphia based company called Atlas Media. And we are looking to get root because we want to install OpenWRT. A local hacking space and bookstore called Ify Books has gotten their hands on a bunch of these and they want to use them to experiment with mesh networking. The natural progression there is to install OpenWRT. That's pretty easy to do on a well supported device, but unfortunately this device is not supported. I believe the architecture should be, but the device itself is not. So we're gonna have to do a little bit of the groundwork to get OpenWRT on here. Uh, and again, I'm just gonna start with root. So I'm just gonna walk you through some of the steps that I've taken and uh, you know, talk about a little bit about where I wanna take this from here. So without further ado, let's hop in. So one of the first things we wanna do when we hack a piece of hardware is research. A well-researched plan will be so much more efficient and we'll just allow this to be a, such an easy process. A lot of times you'll find that someone else has already done most of the legwork for you. And so you can just follow some step-by-step -step instructions and either you know, find yourself at the goal you wanted or at least a few steps ahead. In this case, this device is kind of weird and obscure. So we're gonna have to do a little bit of uh, kind of basic research. And especially in the United, for devices you know, distributed in the United States, FCCID.io is a really valuable resource. If you live in Flipper world, then you've probably heard of this because it's a great place to find the operating frequencies of your device uh, that you're looking to hack. And so you can troubleshoot, figure out whether this is actually a device that works within the range of the Flipper. Uh, and you know, if, if, it's, if it is and it's not working, you can kind of pare down some different ideas. But there's a lot of information here, right? There's user manuals, there's test reports, there's like different documentation of, uh, you know, communication between the FCC and this company. And there's also photographs. So there is an internal teardown already available for us. And this is oftentimes gonna be a pre-production model. So indeed, like these might not be the exact same chips. It might not be the exact same stuff, but it's usually gonna give us at least an idea of what we're working with. And I'm gonna just scroll down here real fast and we're gonna take a peek because there's a lot of chips available. So right here is the flash memory. It is 64 megabytes of flash memory. Uh, so enough for OpenWRT, which is what we're looking for. And I, I do think it's NAND flash after doing some research. So at least that's good. That usually means we get, we get more reads writes out of it, which is nice. Uh, we have a Broadcom Wi-Fi chip. We have, uh, this is the uh, RAM, and I think this is like 512 megabytes of DDR2. And then there's, uh, I think this is the CPU. So this is like a Broadcom CPU. And uh, this is the kind of information that we wanna like write down, keep track of. So definitely keep a working document so that you know you can reference this information later. It will be valuable, uh, but you might also see a red flag. So if you are familiar with like Broadcom and open source, you'll know that uh, they have a very sorted history and open source drivers for Broadcom generally don't work very well. Uh, they'll make the chip function, but they don't give full performance. And then usually you're going to have like no five gigahertz and like very limited 2.4 gigahertz performance. I think that has to do with the way that the uh, driver, the proprietary driver accesses like the region and the open source ones can't. So essentially they, they can't tell how powerful they they can go where the max is so they default to the very base power consumption and that means you're just not going to get more than like 55 megabits per second so this is actually a, a good time to think about pivoting right if your goal is to put this in the production maybe that's not a good idea and you can maybe say okay i'm going to take a different direction here uh maybe you want to just customize the existing firmware maybe you want to buy a whole new piece of hardware so that you can you know try and open, install open wrt i think we can get the wl drivers working which are like the pre-compiled proprietary broadcom drivers uh so that's okay and even if we can't frankly this is just going to be used as a test bed so this is not need maximum performance and we're not super concerned about that. And I just want to see if I can install OpenWRT on something for the lulls. And so we're going to, we're going to keep powering through, but I think it's important just to recognize that, you know, you don't have to get stuck within 
like a specific scope like that be flexible you know uh work with the hardware and like figure out what you can do with it not what necessarily it can do for you i'm gonna also pop back up real fast then we're gonna take a peek at one little spot and that is this so this should be a uart and uart is essentially a way we can get serial so i'm going to be able to wire in hopefully uh as long as they haven't like removed these in the production or you know post-production but uh we should be able to wire up connect our flipper zero and use it as a uh usb to uart medium and get a serial connection so usually that'll allow us to get uh, access to the console and uh, so at the very least we can like find out some information about the boot process which can be useful uh, it might also allow us to even get a, access to a, a shell, sometimes even a root shell. Like they, they leave a lot of weird stuff on here for debugging purposes in the factory. And it's the assumption is that you're not opening this device up uh, as we'll talk about later because, oh my God. So armed with this information, we can start making some moves uh, and doing a little bit more research. So the next thing I did was just throw in this documentation CD. It's a documentation only CD. You don't need drivers to use a Wi-Fi router. So I figured maybe they might hide some of the information they don't want to have to disclose, like open source licensing here. I didn't find anything great, just a 101 page PDF that accurately documented the factory firmware. However, I did find my first hint. Uh, in checking the file properties, I was able to notice that the author of this file was not Atlas Media, but a company called Tenda. And Tenda is a Chinese router manufacturer. So this is what's considered a white labeled product. It's when uh, a manufacturer uses their pre-existing models and like sells them as like rebranded devices for different distributors. This is actually an FH1200 board inside of an F1200 uh, shell. So that did throw me off a little bit uh, and that kind of messed up my uh, my path as I went forward. But it's still, just, this is really valuable information because this allows us to start looking towards Tenda so that uh, you know we can expand our scope and maybe find vulnerabilities elsewhere. The first thing I did notice was that OpenWRT is supported on at least one Broadcom based Tenda device. Uh, and this is awesome because this is like just a good omen that it's very likely that we can get this to work as long as we can find the right place to shuffle in some firmware. I also was able to find a couple of different CVEs. I, I wasn't able to look much deeper into that, I ran into a bunch of 404s, a bunch of just like aired out pages, and it, it seemed like I was having a hard time actually figuring out how to uh, enact that information. I wasn't able to find it anything on like exploit DB, uh, stuff like that. So I, I I felt a little bit defeated there, uh, but I, it was good to know that I, I did, that there were just vulnerabilities in this device. So the next step I took was to just attack this web configurator. So to start off, I just, you know, inspected the HTML, checked a little bit. Uh, I was able to find a few files, a few folders, some documentation in Chinese and references to Tenda. And so, you know, luckily I already knew that uh, coming into it, but, you know, it was nice to get a little lay of the land. And I decided that I wanted to find out more information about what was, you know, sitting on the, 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 the website of this firmware. So to try doing that, I wanted to use Durbuster. Uh, Durbuster allows us to use a dictionary attack and kind of suss out what folders and files might exist on a website. Unfortunately, I hit a wall here for two reasons. One is that one of the options in Durbuster is that you can check multiple types of uh, websites or multiple like file endings, right? You can check for uh, .php, HTML, TXT, uh, you know, and in this case, this page is actually using .asps, and I'm not super familiar with what that is. Uh, I'm, I'm not really a big like web hacker. That that threw me off. I didn't add those into my search, and so I was never going to find a lot of the pages that existed on this firmware. Uh, the other issue I ran into was that after about 30 seconds to a minute of running this attack, I was getting kicked off the router. Uh, so apparently this thing has some sort of DDoS protection and this was booting me. And so the only way I could run a, a, a full attack was or a full run through a dictionary was to uh, actually run it at a single thread. 
And that was really time consuming. It took about four hours to get through a medium Cali Durbuster dictionary. And I really wish I could have gone through the full dictionary. So that would have been like a full overnight and then some. And I, I honestly just kind of like was feeling a little defeated here. So I, I ended up not going down that route. It felt like the not the most efficient use of my time. And maybe I could go back to that if I really needed to. So I just started poking around a little bit more. Uh, I found out that there is some, uh, you know, XSS or cross-site scripting possible in this router. That's not usually the most efficient way to get into the backside of a website. Like that, that may not even give you that kind of access, except for the fact that we are logged into this page as an administrative user, at least. There maybe was some potential there. I never, you know, got too far into figuring that out. Uh, but it was just good to know again that there's multiple vulnerabilities in this uh, firmware and that you know these firmwares are kind of trash. The next thing I did was run into this configuration file. So you can just back up your config as is common in a lot of routers, things like that. And it turns out the backed up config is just a plain text and it has a host of different options in it. And some of those options seemed intriguing to me. So uh, one was that there's a possibility of, of a Samba server, or ability to start a Samba server, probably for you know versions or models of these devices that have like a USB port. So you can like plug a hard drive in and it'll turn into a Samba share across your network. Uh, and the other one was an references to an FTP server. This is just like good to know uh, that there's a possibility. I did try tweaking the configuration file, setting it back up and like hoping to like uh, enact just like an open FTP server or something. Uh, that, that wasn't the case, but you know, I tried playing around with re-uploading some of the configuration with like different settings and uh, it, it wasn't super successful, but that was at least good to know. And there was some interesting references in there. Uh, at this point, I was kind of starting to be a little bit like concerned. I wasn't finding some of the information I wanted. And it just happened to be that I ended up at Iffy Books. And I ended up talking with someone who directed me at this blog post uh, that had kind of come out as I had gotten my hands on this router. And this person had gotten a little bit further than me because uh, he used a valuable tool that I wasn't super familiar with, and I'm really glad that I was able to, to learn about it through this process. So we're going to go through the website and we're going to quickly chat about, uh, you know, what we were able to do and how we were able to accomplish this. I'm going to leave a link down below. Essentially, we found a lot of the same information. However, when he figured out what product this really was, he went ahead and downloaded the publicly available firmware for that device. And he was able to use a tool called binwalk to extract the contents of the binary file. With a little bit of extra work, he was able to get at the squash FS, which is like a compressed file system for uh, our firmware here. And in doing that, he was able to find a few more holes. So apparently there are some interesting things in the CGI bin. And one of those is a script that dumps the flash memory. So if you wget it or curl it and output the, the results, then you end up with like a 64 megabyte file that is going to contain our firmware. He was able to get 64 megabytes. Now I ran into eight. So I, I was getting eight megabytes and then it was saying, like, hey, there's a bunch more, but we can't read it. And I think that I was running into that DDoS protection again. So I'm not exactly sure what happened here. Maybe I've just done something differently and, and tripped something up. But uh, you know he was able to extract 64 megabytes, and so he might have some more valuable information than I have. However, I was able to get a squash FS out of it. This is all the things he had to deal with to get through there. But what we do find out in this firmware is that they essentially left just like all the users and their salted hash passwords in etc password and etc shadow. So if we take those hashes, they're pretty easy to crack. You just run them through Hashcat or something like that. And we're going to come up with a root password of fire it up, capital F. Uh, this is super helpful, but now we just need a way in. And apparently one of his co colleagues found a Telnet D hole. So I, I don't know why that a lot of these firmware manufacturers seem to love Telnet for doing like debugging, but they seem to have left Telnet in here uh, and all you have to do is go to the URL 192.168.01 or like the IP of the router and slash go form slash telnet. I, for me it was telnet not telnet D I, I don't know but if you 
uh, execute a get or just literally just like, you know, go to that in the browser and you're logged in through the, uh, through the, to the router itself, it'll just initiate telnet. And we already have the password, so we can tell that in, and we have the credentials. So there you go, we're at root. And that, that was valuable. It, it helped me figure out, uh, I, you know, a bunch of information about like the processor and the like, memory. Uh, you know, I was able to cat out certain things, certain files in uh, the proc folder. So this is all good and valuable information, but apparently there's another way we can get in. So as I was saying earlier, there is a UART connection here and we can take advantage of that. We can wire in and uh, they even look, even reference a flipper here because you know flipper is in. So I'm gonna do that regardless of, the, of whether we need to, uh, just because I, I think that this is gonna be, uh, you know, just fun to do. However, getting in there will give us like ultimate root because Telnet will drop us after about 25 minutes or so. So it's kind of annoying. You have to keep telnetting in, restarting telnet, and then telnetting in. We're also going to be able to see the CFE boot prompt and maybe interact with that. So the CFE boot prompt, CFE is the bootloader for uh, Broadcom chips. There is oftentimes a way to TFTP over a, a new uh, bin file, but it's actually not going to be a bin file. I think it's going to be like a .trx which is why we can't actually flash it using the utility. Uh, we need to go through here because it's it basically, we don't have the proper headers to get through their defenses or whatever. So in the CFE boot prompt though, we can just you know bypass that. But it's also valuable because if I if I brick this by trying to put OpenWRT on there, we can just keep trying to put OpenWRT on through the CFE prompt, or maybe even try to just put that Tenda firmware back on or try to repackage the bin uh that i have from dropping the atlas firmware you know we, there's a lot of different options this this is where we're going to get ourselves in and the next step that i have to do is really just build openwrt and i've been working on that i've been trying to get the right build together uh, it's easy to to just want to shove too many things into this but i think that we just really need a smaller uh, firmware that kind of matches a similar size i i, I suspect that there's like an eight megabyte partition that we have to sit within and i uh, you know i just want to make a nice clean concise open wrt build that has all the proper drivers that we need for it so i'm in that process i'm working through that if it's not my first time compiling a kernel or compiling a, an operating system but this is like just a little bit different so i'm, I'm jumping my way through here and uh yeah there we go so we've gotten root uh, we, we now know how we can inject our firmware and we just need to make it. This is awesome and I'm really excited. This was like a fun journey for me and I can't wait to finish it off. Uh, I hope to be able to be the one who gets up in WRT on this really just because I want to be able to do it. I, there, there is like a bounty, a small, very small bounty available for this, but I'm really more concerned about just like the fun of being able to, you know, uh, plug in and do some cool hacking putting a little of this stuff that i've you know learned over the last few years into like actual practice uh, for a reason for a nice fun end goal you know so these folks can do some open wrt mesh networking and uh yeah i don't know i mean it's just cool it's just fun to do i, I really like enjoy playing with hardware and i'm glad i get to use my flipper zero in this too because i i do like to be able to showcase that the flipper does have capabilities and that it's a powerful tool right like the Flipper Zero will not hack this device for me, but without a Flipper Zero, then, you know, uh, I do have one of these. I, I have a, a serial adapter, but I, you know, you know, you don't have to have one of these. You can just use your Flipper. So it's cool. It's fun. And uh, yeah, thanks for hanging out. And, you know, I hope this hasn't been too long and too boring, but uh, hopefully I'll see you for the next one. Bye.